the martyrs <coughs> Barcelonus and Peter were both martyred under Diocletian in the year 302. Marcellinus was a priest and Peter an exorcist. They were horribly tormented and tortured and eventually in the wood decapitated. And when a few years later the peace of Constantine made it possible to have churches, a church was erected over the place where their bodies were buried on the Via Lubicana in Rome, not far from where we used to live. The other martyr remembered on this day is St. Erasmus, who perished the following year, 303, and was a bishop. The names of Marcellinus and Peter come towards the end of the second list of martyrs, the one after the consecration. It's the last group of martyrs before those seven women martyrs, which seem to have been added as an afterthought to balance out the genders. And therefore, they are part of our faith and worship to this day, crossing over the centuries. This morning at seven, using also the faculty to celebrate this memorial in the new rite, because the date has not been changed. I used the Roman canon for obvious reasons, and as I often do in the Hermitage, from the Epiclesis onwards, I go into chant mode and also into Latin. And when one does that, one is very much aware, because it links one also with the formation in the monastery where that was the daily fair at the high altar, sung in Latin. With all the graces that have come down the centuries while consecrating the Lamb of God, time stands still. In the Gospel that was used in the New Rite today, it was actually that of the threefold questioning of Peter, do you love me? And that is interesting as it happens, for it also collocates us in the whole faith of Rome, on which our faith here in Ireland is built. Remember, it was from Rome that missionaries were sent to the Western world, notably England, but also the influences there by cross-fertilization. And we know the Roman canon was the one used in the whole of the West, even in the Celtic Church. Therefore, on Ireland's land too, the same words echoed, or rather whispered, in the early centuries, unchanged in their sound and in their effect. And also, that one phrase comes through the centuries, which links us precisely with Peter. This precious chalice. That means that in the early celebrations, they are using the chalice that Lord used, and it's stuck there out of force of habit to this day in the old Roman canon, as have also these martyrs, indicating the antiquity of this canon. Other indications are also there of its antiquity, the reference to Jewish roots. We have Jewish names coming in there as points of appeal. Abraham, Abel, Melchizedek, the angel, and so on. So power is there unchanged and not hurried to change. And when one relives all the masses of the past, it's as though while consecrating the Lord, one feels again the joy of that first encounter. As it happens, one day I was looking again at old pictures of the monastery in Italy, and I came across again a picture of the precious chalice that we had, which was only brought out for big occasions. And because the first mass was a big occasion and was also the Feast of All the Saints, we had that chalice. And I remember looking again in the picture at that chalice, how at that moment something had hit me. We were taught to celebrate well using all the body, 
and therefore we were taught when consecrating to bow profoundly over the elements to be consecrated. And of course one is facing the other way normally in the monastery. And therefore alone and isolated with God. But I remember at that first consecration something strangely hit me. And these things are not invented or put on, they come. And it was this. As I looked down on, at that point, the wine, yet to be made blood, it hit me how close the priest becomes to the Blessed Trinity at that point. One is looking at one moment at wine, and because of what comes through one's vocal cords, that is changed, invisibly normally, but really, and one is actually touching God. One is rather like that picture of Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel, when man is created and when there is voltage passing from the creative finger of the Father to the receiving finger of Adam. Well here there's something in reverse. God is, as it were, depending on man at that point for this to happen. And it really hit me, the priesthood is something quite different from anything that man has invented, e.g. in other denominations. It's not man-based. We're handling God, and therefore the angels are around in fear and trembling. There's a whole invisible world, which by the way, in the well-executed monastic liturgy, is very well suggested. In the specifically Primus Attention rite, we reproduce the Shekinah. Do you know how? It is done like this. When the priest is chanting the preface, the deacon is going around, often with a full-length censer in the eastern rite, right round the high altar with great big gushes of incense in such a way that by the end of the preface and the beginning of the sanctus, the priest and any concelebrants around are completely, almost invisible in incense and it goes up into the rafters together with the chant, which echoes perfectly in the medieval church made for that. It echoes and echoes and echoes, and comes down and says, this is what we're made for. We recognize this chant. There's something unchanging there. And also, the other end of the scale, the hidden and the intimate, because each one of us, once ordained, had the free choice either to concelebrate with the brethren at the High Mass or to use the slot between matins and lords to celebrate in private. There might actually be even two celebrations going on simultaneously at that point on different altars. And that was actually not less but more intense in its own way. The splendour was hidden, but boy was it real. And there, one used one of the old altars, usually the oldest of all. The foundation was 781, because Charles the Great, Chagnamayn, founded it after a miracle in the area. And it was an ex voto of gratitude for the miracle. And therefore, that altar went right back to the high Middle Ages and was dense with prayer. It was also the altar on which we as deacons were taught how to say Mass. And each gesture was given its meaning by the one who was forming us, indicating that everything has a reason. And by the way, one only understands the new if one has also experienced the old, because all that's in the new is coming from the old, and that does not be perceived unless one has actually celebrated and known it. So this was what we were at. One day, a message came from Wales. This was years after ordination, but it was from a student who had actually, in student days, passed me her Hebrew notes and had eventually done a doctorate, was going to be a Protestant minister and was ordained actually by a friend of ours, the Anglican Bishop of Bangor, who studied with us as a student. But then, and this is the point, she was on the brink. She was uncomfortable and she had an itch. Am I in the right church? And so, with a bit of prodding, we got her to the real church. And the first thing she did was to come over 
on retreat to us. So I showed her the old books, and all she could say was, when you see something like that, one sees the difference. Do you know why? I explained to her how in the old rubrics, the sacred was hugely protected, e.g. from the moment of consecration to the second ablution, one is not allowed to separate these two fingers. And all I went to explain how all the time, all the time, there was a huge barrage of protection, indicating also how at the moment of consecration, the old, 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 old rite, way back, before, way before the Council of Trent, the shock was so great that the priest immediately would fall to his knees. And when eventually, to counteract a heresy, they brought in the elevation for the people to adore the Lord and point out there was the presence there at that point, there was afterwards a second genuflection introduced, but the first one remained. And so I went on to explain the history and the genesis of the Mass as it went on until the changes. But all the new comes from the old, and all that should have happened, and has happened in theory, is that it's been streamlined, e.g. the genuflection now has been reduced to one, but it's after and not before, the elevation, and so on. But it's the same, and it's certainly the same power, if well celebrated and not deflected which is where I want to finish. The problem is there. In France, when I spent 10 years, first of all, there was not really a problem. Why? Because if a community of contemplative monks loves the Lord, it will honour the Lord spontaneously, and therefore the new will be celebrated with love. The problem is not there. The problem is that bit when there's not love, an interiority. So focus on the illness. The symptoms have to be looked at for what they are. The illness is on a deeper level. So what has gone wrong, my friends, is this. The application of renewal presupposed one thing, that there was love and affection. Alas! What did we find? People using the slot of liturgy to sit in the throne of Christ as DJs and draw attention to themselves. The slot of having an audience, the slot of being interested and spectacular. Okay, we can do it if we want to, but are we surprised if bit by bit the grace is not given, or if it is, is well reflected, and people bit by bit lose interest? Because they're meeting not God, but man. The first time lines written after the first Mass on All Saints Day, 1997. O oh light, O oh might, O oh whiteness of my God, here coming, coming, come upon a word. O oh clasping of my Lord, here where have trod the feet of sacred armies now unheard. Yet heard again in these soft, fiery sounds that worked here in my hands an ancient change that angels find air new. For there surrounds this naught of naught here bent a denseness strange. My God, as I, all particles here gazed, they did here cease to be. And I beheld 
with ne'er a ray of sight, what all amazed my friend here at my side. For he ne'er held the Godhead as his ward, nor did the sword of angel speech e'er reach this wound out poor.